The problem of what grounds our moral assertions, like murder is wrong, is a problem for all moral systems. In this video, I put forth and reply to a criticism of this kind that's oft leveled against virtue ethics. The criticism that virtue ethics is ungrounded, either because it rests on an untenable naturalized teleology or because it rests on rationalization of subjective opinion. I happen to think that in being able to reply to this criticism in the way that it alone can, virtue ethics is better placed to answer foundational skepticism than either purely duty or purely consequence-based alternatives. So let's get on then. Where virtue ethics is the claim that moral goodness can be understood in terms of virtue, it is often said to fail because virtue is neither objective nor subjective. That is, virtue can neither be understood in terms of mind-independent facts nor in terms of mind-dependent values. Even though, in order for moral goodness to be understood as virtue, that is, for virtue ethics to be true, Virtue itself must be either understood as, one, an objective characteristic of things, two, a subjective response to evident characteristics, or three, some combination of both. The reason why objective virtue escapes our understanding, it is argued, is because virtue, understood as something independent of mere opinion, depends upon nature proceeding to a plan and upon the character which is said to be virtuous as leading to a disposition to act in accord with nature's plan. But, we are cautioned, according to the teachings of Darwin, nature has no such plan. The watchmaker of natural selection is, as both Richard Dawkins and Karl Marx pointed out, blind, working without any pre-extant conception of an eventual outcome thereby ruling out any objective understanding of virtue as moral goodness. The reason why subjective virtue escapes any useful understanding, it is argued, is because virtue, understood as something dependent upon subjective opinion, entails a motive particularism. The idea that what's right and wrong, morally speaking, is entirely a matter of what someone's passions or desires happen to be at a particular time, and in a particular place. But we are, once again cautioned, a motive particularism is insufficiently universal as to yield any functional morality, offering no way of communicating or convincing those who don't happen to share our passions or the circumstances of their formation, thereby ruling out any subjective understanding of moral goodness as virtue. So virtue cannot, on this reasoning, be either objective or subjective nor indeed can it consist in any conceivable combination of the objective and the subjective. Moral goodness cannot thus be understood in terms of virtue, and virtue ethics thereby fails. Bummer. But wait, all is not lost. Firstly, because there is a possible situation in which virtue has objective grounds, but nature need not have a plan. And secondly, because there is a possible situation in which virtue is a matter of moral passion, but does not entail a motive particularism. In the first case, it is possible for virtues to be rooted in natural history, including a social history that is, in its substance, natural. And it's possible for this history to unfold without having any end goal in mind whilst nevertheless yielding an apparent purposefulness or teleonomy, an apparent purposefulness which can inform notions of flourishing, grounding virtues independently of the accidents of personal opinion, all without nature having any preconsidered plan. In the second case, it's also possible that morality is centred upon the passions of the subject, while those desires themselves have natural histories and for those histories to provide a universal framework for the evaluation of those passions, a means to decide which conflicting judgment is superior. 
Thus, even though virtue ethics depends on virtue being either objective, subjective, or both, and even though it's true that nature does not have a plan, and that emotive particularism is morally insufficient, virtue ethics can nevertheless be true. Moral goodness can therefore, despite these admitted truths, be adequately understood as a virtue. Virtue ethics thus escapes the criticism. Yay! Now, I've responded to the, the is ought gap and to Moore's open question argument elsewhere on this channel, and I'll doubtless address them here again in greater detail in the future. But apart from those hoary old chestnuts, the foundational dilemma addressed here is probably that most commonly deployed against naturalistic, neo-Aristotelian forms of virtue ethics like mine. If, as I hope I've provided a satisfactory response to this objection, it will go some way to establishing virtue ethics as a viable, progressive alternative to the current Kantian duty-based political morality, a role for which I think virtue ethics is better suited. Thank you for listening.